preseason ends on a high note as cut down day looms. Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast. You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day each and every day. And welcome to a special Sunday episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast as the Vikings played on Saturday. My name is Luke. You can find the show wherever you find your favorite podcast. Just search it out on whatever podcasting place you enjoy, uh, including Sirius XM, where you can get live broadcasts of all Vikings games as well as Amazon Fire and Roku if you download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app and, of course, YouTube. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. We're here on a Sunday today. If you are a, a, a morning commuter and you're listening to this Monday morning, though, hello from the future. You might even have more information about cutdowns than I do because sometimes teams get a head start there. For the rest of us, uh, it's by 3 p.m. Central on Tuesday will be the deadline to get all of the actual cuts in. So Tuesday will kind of be the big cutdown day, and that gives us a, a minute to at least sort of marinate on the Eagles game. The Vikings end preseason in strong fashion, 26 to 3 total domination of the Eagles over there at Lincoln Financial Field. Obviously, it's our depth versus their depth, and it's it's our roster cuts versus their roster cuts, right? So it's not like that does anything to like preview the season for either team, but it's still nice to see all of the depth players, and especially the ones that are the do figure to make the team playing well, and um, it, the, the team just being organized even at the lowest depths of the roster uh, it's nice to see, as meaningful or not as it is. Um, and and maybe at the top of that is probably the story of this game is Jaron Hall. Jaron Hall finding a way probably onto the 53-man roster. He has a great game, throws two touchdowns, very safe with the football after the first drive. First drive had one r- pretty bad interception that was uh, nulled by an illegal contact penalty on Philadelphia, uh, it, it was a bad throw. You shouldn't do that one. Uh, but after that, kind of shaking it off and then having a really nice sort of half and a little bit extra before he actually gets taken out with what Kevin O'Connell called a leg contusion, said it was minor, nothing to worry about, but we figured we had seen enough. So they put Matt Corral in to clean out the rest of the preseason. And they had uh, they had planned to have Corral in for, for the fourth quarter, but they put him in a little early. Uh, just to be safe there. Beyond the stats, what I liked about the Jaron Hall game most was how comfortable he looked. That's what I was really looking for. After that that Packers, what was it, Sunday night, Monday night football disaster um, against Green Bay on New Year's Eve, that disaster, the, the worry was that that was a career-ruining game. And it probably would have been if J.J. McCarthy didn't get hurt because I don't think that there's really any need to keep a fourth quarterback on your roster, and Jaron Hall was a very clear fourth. But with McCarthy out of the equation for now, you do need a third QB to have, if at the very least, to dress as an emergency QB. And the question was going to be, is that Jaron Hall or is it a waiver claim? And and like alternate universe where Jaron Hall shows up, has a real bag. Maybe that interception doesn't get nulled by the by the penalty. And then he spirals on it and he then he has another bad one. And, you know, and, and, and he gets sacked a bunch of times and, and it's just a total disaster game. In that world, you probably release him and start monitoring waiver claims. That's not the world we live in now, though, that that he played well. Uh, he showed that, that resiliency, you can make a mistake, you can bounce back from it and everything looked very comfortable and properly timed. Even though it was the vanilla version of the offense, seeing him execute the staples with the right timing is encouraging. Um, and I think that's enough to give you the QB three nod. Now, look, after last year, I probably shouldn't be saying this. 
But it's not that likely that we ever see the Vikings have to turn to Jaron Hall. You'd have to have Sam Darnold and Nick Mullins both hurt. I don't think there's a world where those guys play so bad that you're like, let's put Jaron Hall in. Uh, but knowing the Vikings, they love to make me eat my words like that. But being able to sort of stay in rhythm and really sharply dice up a bunch of third and fourth teamers, a whole bunch of roster cut practice squad types and, and like look like it was like that's easy. OK, that level of competition is easy for you sort of means, OK, well, then maybe you do belong on a roster if you're carving up a bunch of people who don't. Um, it's really reassuring. And that's just like one less thing to worry about when, if the Vikings are going to go looking for kind of cut down day trades or, or waiver claims or whatever, the, the Quasi does seem like the kind of guy that likes to bring in one or two players, uh, every cut down day. And, uh, so we'll see where all of that ends up, but there are a couple other players who really like kind of made their case for, you know, you should roster me. Um, in addition to Jaron Hall, just I think being able to defeat, you know, generic waiver claim number three, as I've been kind of calling it, because I keep seeing that in like political polls. What about a generic Democrat, right? Uh, but, you know, generic QB three waiver claim type, Jaron Hall beating that guy. Um, I thought Tristan Jackson, he played one drive or two drives maybe and had a pretty good showing, had a, a nice fade touchdown. That was also a beautiful ball from Jaron Hall. Um, Trent Sherfield with what I thought was a pretty good game, but again, marred by just like one really nasty mistake, uh, the, a, a holding penalty this time a little bit after a couple of really good blocks and he, he didn't help me. <laughs> if you remember my 53 man roster episode from, uh, last week where I kind of agonized over Trent Sherfield and, what do we do with him? And and I, I actually had it down. I had 54 players on the roster and I had it down to cutting one of Jaron Hall and Trent Sherfield. And I thought, you know what? Jaron Hall, I think they still like him enough and let's let's keep the quarterback and, and you know, hey, he has, he has a good game against the Eagles and this becomes easier. Well, he had a good game against the Eagles. That became easier. So for my roster projection, I'd have to get rid of somebody that either didn't play in this game uh, or somebody that, you know, I, I thought had like a better path to the roster to save him but that's only my projection and like I kept other people that you might not agree with or whatever so in terms of just like in a vacuum how Trent Sherfield did the problem is it's I just I, I, I the reason I left him at player 54 is because I was so 50 50 on him and I couldn't find room but if it were easier to find room I would have kept him um and I think that might be the same dilemma the Vikings are going to deal with here too is if it's easy to find room I could see them keeping Trent Sherfield I think as as well as Lucky Jackson played, he has this very sick helmet catch. I don't know if it was quite enough, like maybe a little bit too little too late. You know, somebody like Justin Hall has a great sequence in the red zone um, where he gets like a catch and then another catch and then a couple more targets and then a touchdown. Like as much production as you can ask for from a guy who just joined the roster two days ago, uh, that looks great for him, but like, yeah, maybe, maybe too little too late, you know, maybe too little too late for somebody like Jay Sean Jones who gets a couple catches, drops a touch. I shouldn't call it a drop. It was like a diving catch on a floating weird scramble drill from Jaron Hall. He could have brought it in, uh, but didn't. So all those guys, I feel like fall away. I really feel like it is Trent Sherfield or nobody. And then, you know, Lucky Jackson on the practice squad feels like a great thing or whoever else you want to keep on the practice squad for that. But in terms of the 53, I think it's either Trent Sherfield or you just keep five wide receivers um, and it just remains difficult. I don't know. It, it, he had enough ups and enough downs to like reinforce whichever side of that you, you land on. So I still am kind of unsure of what's going to happen there with Trent Sherfield. But hey, there's more than just the quarterbacks and the wide receivers. A lot of other players who I, I think really made a case for you got to roster me that are people that I, I don't necessarily think are going to be on everybody's 53 man projection, but are starting to force that conversation. And the question is, is it too little too late? That'll be next on Lockdown Vikings. Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience are the formula to winning a championship and to keeping your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. No matter what that vehicle is for, whether it's for getting your you and your family to from point A to point B, getting you to work on time, using it for work, 
uh, or whatever it is that your car is for. I mean, it's an expression of style and your personality and who you are and your lifestyle and all of that. So make sure you take good care of that thing. And to do that, you need parts. Over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die at eBay Motors. You will find exactly what you're looking for every time or your money back. That's the eBay guaranteed fit. No matter what make and model your car is, they'll make sure you have a compatible part from their gigantic catalog, and they can help you narrow all that down. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day. When you're done here, go check out Locked On Fantasy Football. If you're not into that one already, get prepped for your draft and just mercilessly dunk on your friends and loved ones or co- or coworkers who you don't love and therefore want to punish in fantasy football. Let Vinny Iyer take you to the promised land over there at Locked On Fantasy Football. Moving on here with the Locked On Vikings podcast, there are a few other players in this 26-3 win over the Eagles that I think really had notable enough performances to maybe make the Vikings rethink what they were going to do on the 53-man roster. Uh, One notable performance that has no ambiguity on the 53-man roster is Will Reichard, 4-for-4 on field goals on the day, including a 57-yard boomer made with absolutely no drama whatsoever. Uh, Look... I'm not going to get hyped about a kicker, okay? You can't make me get hyped about a kicker. I I will refuse to do it, but the temptation is getting stronger, (laughs) and I don't know how much more strength I have. Uh, It's really cool. I mean, all of these kicks have been totally no drama. One miss in the whole preseason, uh, and that was a block that you could argue wasn't even his fault unless you want to talk about, like, kick trajectory or whatever. And it was a long kick anyway, so a low trajectory would have been appropriate, and you just went a little too low with it, like, not a huge mistake at all. Uh, so Riker, great stuff, but no ambiguity, ambiguity there. He already won his battle. We know he's making the roster. Somebody like Nikhil Harry, has he done enough here? And I think that one might be a little too, too little, too late where he had a catch. He had some interesting blocks, but the thing about it is that room's banged up enough where he, they might need him, even though I think he's sixth in that room when all is said and done. Like, if you count injured guys, Hawkinson, Oliver, Johnny Munt, Nick Muse, Robert Tunyon, and then Nikhil Harris probably sixth in that room, but no no Hawkinson and possibly no Tunyon, who is still working off to the side. They think he feels good for week one, but also hasn't had a preseason at all. So is he even going to make the team, or are you going to take the guy that's been working with y'all camp, and that would be Harry, might have... Like that, that might be his path to the roster and therefore having a game that's just sort of sound and solid would be exactly what he needed. Uh, also the two running backs that played most of the game in miles Gaskin and Dwayne McBride thought miles Gaskin had a pretty good game, you know, uh, hit the right gaps, a very veteran game, sound game, nothing too crazy. One pass pro rep. That was maybe if he, I, I was watching the Eagles broadcast. I, I, a lot of people in Minnesota got the Vikings broadcast with like Kevin O'Connell in the whole third quarter and all this great stuff. Uh, jealous of you. I was listening to the Eagles broadcast, but they did say that that one pressure that probably was on miles Gaskin was a good pass pro rep. Uh, and they had an old lineman like kind of breaking down, you know, like how, how a lot of times running backs, is just the name of the game is just survive, even if it's ugly. So I kind of am sympathetic to that. So I don't know, nothing to write home about in a good way for Miles Gaspin. And I thought D.Way McBride had something to write home, home about in a very good way, uh, in the way that he, especially in space, the way he ran through tackles, he, he seems to have taken something of a step forward this preseason, but is that enough to justify a roster spot when guys like Kenny Wongwu and Ty Chandler aren't even playing here. Of course, Aaron Jones is going to get the Lions care of the Sherries. Lions care of the Sherries. Lions share the carries uh, in actual meaningful play. Um, On defense, guys that maybe made a case, but it could be a lost cause, somebody like Jalen Redmond. Is there room for a Jalen Redmond on this roster? It's really hard to find it. Uh, but the D line did a very interesting kind of rotation with, um, Jaqueline Roy, Taki Taimani, James Lynch, Levi Drake, Rodriguez, Jalen Redmond, like all of these guys that we don't know who kind of makes up guys four and five after your sort of principal already pretty much declared starters in Phillips Bullard and, uh, Jerry Tillery after those three, um, barring any surprises, 
then you kind of have like one or two other spots, probably two because their base formation has three of those like interior guys. Um, after those three, who gets the next two spots? I still think Levi Drake Rodriguez has kind of cemented one. Uh, but after that, we all kind of penciled one in for Jaquel and Roy, but what if it isn't, right? What if it is somebody like Taimani who's had a really, really strong preseason or Jalen Redmond who's had a really strong preseason? Maybe the play of the day came for Jalen Redmond who in the middle of the scrum just took the ball away. I believe that forced fumble got credited to Levi Drake Rodriguez, but upon replay, he just yanked that thing out uh, and got ended the, the Eagles' first drive on that. Really, really cool play for Redmond, who has had a very strong preseason. I would love to see him stay in the building one way or another. Uh, and then somebody like Dwight McGlother, who had another really strong day in coverage and then had had a sack on, uh, I believe it was Tanner McKee, where he just could not bring that guy down. <laughs> Dragging around the ankles like a child having a temper tantrum in Walmart. And Tanner McKee ended up, it was a fourth down, Ended up, I don't know if he uh, affected the throw that much because he was you know, literally holding the feet down so you can't go through the right throwing motion or if Tanner McKee's brain fell out and he threw it away on fourth and four. But uh, it, it went sailing out of the end zone and ended up being a turnover on downs anyway. So pretty much just as good as a sack, but not credited with one. But I will say that is now twice that McLaughlin has had a really, really good play that didn't quite hit the hit the 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 nitrous the way it's supposed to because of an athletic limitation where he got hawked by the quarterback uh, and then he failed to bring the quarterback down. Two things that should never happen when a cornerback goes up against a quarterback. You, you can't let that guy be faster or stronger than you. Uh, so it's kind of funny, but I think it's mostly aesthetics. I don't think it matters. For for my money, I think McLaughlin has made the team. I mean, look, undrafted rookie, never going to be too presumptuous about that. But if, if, if it were me, I'm slamming it. Uh, and then you have this interesting thing with Scene and Ward. Um, and, and a lot of other guys who, let's be honest, some guys got cut here on Saturday. and We'll go over some of those as well. You know, some guys that maybe weren't going to make it anyways, but had enough of a bad uh, of, of a bad game to maybe even rethink their practice squad slot. So we'll go over kind of the losers of the day next. Today's Locked On Vikings episode is brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. It is futures season, especially once roster cuts are done. We know who's going to be playing for who. Trades have all worked themselves out. Whatever holdouts have pretty much been resolved. Uh, and that means that you can get a futures bet down if that's the kind of thing you're into. Vikings plus 850 to win the North. That's actually lower than it's been or shorter than it's been in the past. So if you want to get on something like that, how about this from FanDuel through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. So if you're an emotional hedger and you want to just put down five bucks on the Packers winning the NFC North, because at least you got some money in that case, uh, go ahead and do that and get your free trial of NFL Sunday ticket with a YouTube TV base plan. You'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon and out of market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment. You can cancel anytime. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to download America's number one sports book. Moving on with this preseason recap episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast, perhaps the most interesting battle coming into the uh, roster cut down day thing is uh, is seen in Ward, Lewis seen in Jay Ward. So Jay Ward, the Jay Ward corner experiment seems over with Stefan Gilmore coming in. It seems like they won't need him there. Obviously, cross-training him a little bit. Maybe that comes in handy if you really, really get down to it. But he was a disaster out there. I, I don't think you'd rather put him out there than, like, bringing in some washed street-free agent or pulling off of somebody else's practice squad. But still, Ward at safety kind of went blow for blow with Lewis Seen. This really interesting sequence happened in the game where Lewis Seen was in underneath coverage on a deep over with, um, it, I, I think it was one robber. But it's hard to tell on just the TV copy because, like, you don't see the safety drops. 
but it looked like some kind of one robber, some kind of middle of field closed with some sort of like poaching. So what I mean by that is Jay Ward over the top playing center field, right? Free safety, if, if you will. And then uh, Lewis seen kind of playing underneath it and then basically having to be in like trail underneath position or just cutting under a, a deep crossing route. Quarterback throws it, Seen gets his arm up, but it's just over the tips of his arms and it's caught and Jay Ward makes a tackle. That happens. And then later, the responsibilities are flipped. It's the same coverage, but flipped the other way, which means Seen is doing the deep job and Ward is doing the shallow job and Ward makes that play. With the exact same situation, just like as, as controlled an experiment as possible, Ward made his play and Seen didn't. Um, those are only two plays, though. I thought for my money, like Seen's game was fine. He had a couple of tackles. He was in on a couple of things, had a couple of bad moments, had a DPI in the first quarter that is one to forget. Certainly not the game he had against Cleveland, which if you read uh, my article at, at Wide Left or, or listen to any of my content about that, I thought kind of what didn't look that good. It was a it was a productive game, but it didn't necessarily have the seeds of sustained success. And this game was will go with up and down. So has he done enough? But I remind you, cutting him contract wise is really hard to justify they, they have the cap space to do it but like spending cap space in this year just to lose a player that you then have to bring in another guy and replace and spend more cap is is fairly inefficient so uh you know one of those 2028 draft pick trades is perhaps um the way the vikings would go if they don't want to end up keeping him but this is just my opinion just one podcaster who says eh, i don't know if i really like it uh the vikings very well may disagree with me and might keep him He's a first round pick. What if he's developing? You know, what if this is the he's finally getting a foothold and at NFL speed and then he can still develop one more year and next year is the thing like that sort of thought process. Very uncommon for that to actually play out that way. But if a first round pick shows you anything, you're like, what if this is it? What if it's happening? And you keep it. And and I don't it's hard to begrudge them that anyways. Maybe you just keep the same six safeties you had last year and you do whatever you got to do at corner. And at corner, it's very interesting. So there are a few guys that just got themselves cut, I thought. And these are guys that probably were getting cut anyways. But I mean, look, we talk about somebody like Nikhil Harry or uh, or Jalen Redmond, who's you know probably getting cut, but maybe did enough just by having a reasonable game. But not you, Jalen Williams. <laughs> Corner number 38, scorched. Oh, a rough game for 38. And uh, when you are, you know, playing in the fourth quarter of a preseason game, you can't be the guy that's getting blasted in that particular environment. That is the kind of issue. That's that's the kind of thing that gets you not only cut from the team that you're on, but maybe loses you a practice squad slot. Maybe makes other teams that had a high draft grade on you or, or, or have an interest in maybe bringing you in for a workout go, oh my God, he just got absolutely diced up by Tanner McKee. Can't do it. Uh, and And take you off that list and go call somebody else instead. Those are the kinds of things that end an NFL career. And to me, that's the compelling thing to watch in these third preseason games where you don't really care about the result of the game. You're not here to watch the Matt Corral show, but you might be here to watch Jalen Williams fight for his life. Rough one for him. Um, rough one for Jayshon Jones, who had a couple of catches, but like I said before, as... You know, somebody like Lucky Jackson, as somebody like Justin Hall, just shows up and outplays you when you're an undrafted rookie. Tough to even put that guy on the practice squad when you just kind of saw nothing sustained from him at all. Um, speaking of Matt Corral, uh, thank you for your service, sir. <laughs> but obviously, I mean, look, Matt Corral is a dreadfully bad quarterback. I think we all know that. Uh, but there are kind of two parts to this one part is that he just got here a week ago and so the like his grasp of the concepts is not something i would have a really high expectation of but also i'm not going to put you out there expect you to do nothing and then put you on the roster he really never had a true chance to make the roster i don't think uh and hey you know he's here to do a game check and to eat some preseason reps that because our, our third string guy got hurt um, you know, that's really what you're here to do. And, and those kinds of bodies showed up. There are a lot of those kinds of bodies. on. I think Justin Hall is another one, a couple of own linemen they had. Um, Mo Ibrahim, who looked very slow 
Uh, I think he is just about as cooked as a as a Cajun crab boil. Uh, he is at the there there the, like one play was a toss play I want to say or some kind of outside zone where he he needed to get the edge and an inside linebacker who got through the backfield was chasing him down didn't have the angle at all and just hawked him before the line of scrimmage like four yards back it was a big four yard loss it's like man NFL running back gets that edge that was my my the way I put it in my notes like NFL running back gets that edge okay he's cooked um a couple of good runs for him otherwise like he he did find the space when it was north south downhill but just that acceleration not being there it's like all right yeah you're not the guy that i'm bringing in if i if i need to start calling on practice squad running backs i'm certainly going to gaskin and debo before you uh and also probably just like finding somebody on somebody else's practice squad if i really need the help but again thank you for your service right you know, you weren't here to have a legit chance to make the team. You were here to maybe put a little bit of tape out there, maybe get a call from somebody else. But mostly, you were just here to kind of fill some space for a little while. And you've done that. Here is your paycheck. Thank you very much. Um, Samus Reyes, who finally gets into a game. I, 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 I see why he wasn't before. <laughs> just super blown up on the backside of a zone run. Uh, and his guy chases down the zone run. He basically should never be letting that up as a backside tight end. Like you have such an advantage. You just have to slow him down. So to get smoked that bad was really rough. And that was the only time I noticed him. Uh, but the thing about him, so he's an international pathway player, so he doesn't count against like roster spots. So the Vikings could keep him for free in the building. Um, I don't know if they will, but like they kept Junior Aho in the building last year. He wasn't really part of things. So you might see Samus Reyes on the on the inactives list every single game uh, as somebody who didn't really make the team. But like we might as well keep you here and see if we develop you into something. But I don't really know what you do here. I like I don't know if he goes in before you start going for straight free agents, which for me is sort of the litmus test of like, I don't think I need you in the building. And uh, on the defense or at least defensive line. Oh, buddy, Andre Carter. Oh, Andre Carter. Look, a couple of sacks. Those were good plays. But the thing about defense, I said this on the postcast. The thing about defense, especially defensive line, is that your good plays show up in the box score. And your bad plays don't get your name by them in the box score. You whiff on a tackle, somebody else gets their name. You can't search that out. So you rack up all the stats you want, but if you have six horrible plays and then a sack, you had a pretty bad game. And and for Andre Carter, he's got to give up on that spin move or he's got to find a way to set up those spin moves. So when you want to spin, this drives me nuts. When you want to spin, you got to set it up. Spin move reveals your back. You show your back to the offensive lineman. Now, you show your back to a lineman. He wants to punch you right in the kidney. And by the way, you don't have a lot of leverage when your back is facing somebody. So they're going to be able to get their hands on you and they're going to be able to drive you. And you're going to be cooked. So you got to spin fast. That's the first thing of a spin move. You got to get around fast and minimize the amount of time, that window of time where the O-line just has a giant target. If they hit that, they beat you. But you have to set it up too. That O line can't just sit there and wait and try to time up the, the 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 shot at your back. They have to. You have to give them something else to worry about, which is why you'll see a lot of players. This is why Dwight Freeney was so good at attacking to the in, to to the gap that he wasn't rushing. And if he was rushing C gap, he would attack that inside shoulder then spin. Daniel Hunter did a great job of that too with his spin, spin move. You attack something really hard. And then you do your spin move. It's kind of like how wide receivers run a route. If you uh, listen to like wide receiver fundamentals, when you want to run a good route, everything should look like a go until it isn't because you always want to be threatening with that speed uh, and, and bad routes don't do a good job of threatening that. And then if the corner doesn't respect your go route, they're probably going to be able to jump on your route. It's kind of the same with D line where everything should look like a speed rush until it isn't. And for Andre Carter, you can just super tell that he's going to spin. And then he just kind of gets caught in the back and then he's, it's over. Um, I, I thought there were a lot of moments there. I don't know. I, I, I'm just, I'm done with him. I'm done hearing about the potential of a guy that doesn't have the body composition of an NFL athlete, doesn't have the strength of an NFL athlete. I'm, I'm tired of hearing about like potential because of a spark score and a good senior bowl. I'm done with the experiment. Uh, and another one, Tyler Manoa, I just thought kind of got washed around. Just kind of, I don't know. Guys ate his lunch a little bit too much for me. But the negatives were very individual players that, like, again, are already 
probably going to get cut. And the thing about this game is this is th this third preseason game is a very individual place. This is all about the individual ups and downs and, and who is in, is or isn't making the roster. The actual Vikings who will decide if the season is good or not, we're all in sweats on Saturday. So nothing worth reacting super hard to, which is kind of a bummer because it was about as positive of a game as you could get. They won 26 to three. I kind of wish I could take more, more home from it. Um, but that's not really how the preseason works. It's much more about the individual and yeah, you've got some winners, you've got some losers. So here's the deal. Again, no Monday episode. This is the Monday episode. It's just up early. Uh, so the next time we talk will be Twitter Tuesday. I'll answer your questions and then Tuesday will be cut down day. So Wednesday we'll go over all the cut downs and all the stuff that happened. That's the plan for the week. And then we have like a few shows and then we start getting into like crossovers and stuff. So very excited for all of that. I will see you all Tuesday. And as always, skull.